Okay, so good afternoon. Um, I want to start by thanking Samin for inviting me to be a part of this symposium. Really appreciate it. And I also want to acknowledge and appreciate my incredible collaborator, Sabrina Tapp. So over the last year, we've been thinking a lot about how we can make our science more predictive. And you might be thinking to yourself, you know, Liz, what are you talking about? We already predict things all the time. Why do you think there's a little hat over the Y in our regression equations? Um, or you might be thinking, you know, hold on. Um, we only, we want to reserve prediction for our most um, advanced and mature effects, really. And, you know, and we don't want to jump the gun by formalizing things too early. Well, whether or not you recognize it or whether or not you like it, um, every time you run a linear model, you're creating a mathematical model of psychological phenomena. And we can even express our regression models in their functional form as your criterion being a function of your predictors. Um, so even if you do feel that we should uh, wait until we've you know, amassed a vast literature before we begin trying to create mathematical models of phenomenon, Nonetheless, we are already doing it, and we do it even when we test an effect for the first time ever. But moreover, um, although we use these techniques that are theoretically all about prediction, um, in practice, we use them to explain the past. As in, if you have a hypothesis a priori that uh, satisfaction is a function of mood and behavior, um, then maybe you did predict that before you collected your data, but by the time you sit down to actually run your statistical test, you're merely explaining observations that already occurred. So what I'm here today to say is that perhaps we can use these models to more truly predict the future. And I think that this would uh, manifest in at least two ways. One would be a framework for quantitative pre-registration of new studies, as well as um, a better method for evaluating the success of direct replications, um, as opposed to sort of you know, evaluating patterns of significance um, between you know, a set of studies. So by quantitative pre-registration, I mean pre-registration with numbers. So you post your study materials and your measures and all of these things, perhaps your statistical syntax, but you also publish your prediction model for, in a numerical sense, how you think your independent variables are going to relate to actual values of your dependent variables. Um, an optional step is that um, after you collect your independent variables, but before you collect your dependent variables, you plug those numbers from your IVs into the model, and then you can predict a unique value for each um, participant in your sample. Now, a very important aspect of this approach, though, is that you need to collect your data publicly because it's all about establishing the temporal order um, with which you made your predictions and then collected your actual data. Um, so I'm going to try to make this a little bit more concrete um, by describing two sort of proof of concept studies where I sought to replicate an exploratory finding or a preliminary finding um, from Paige Gould, a, a, a diary study I published in 2012. So in this study, I found that people have more cross-ethnic friends um, get into more cross-ethnic conflicts in everyday life. And this might seem surprising, but when you consider the fact that people with cross-ethnic friends are interacting much more with people of other ethnicities, then it fully explains the effect and the sign even turned around. So in essence, people with cross-ethnic uh, cross friends have a lot of intergroup interaction, and thus they have more opportunities for conflict. So, um, you know, I, I, it, I wasn't necessarily going for this effect when I was, in, was running that study, but I really believed it. It just sort of rang true to me, so I tried to, I decided to put my money where my mouth was and try to replicate it here. So, um, the first step is obviously to create your prediction model. We want to do this precisely, but there are some challenges to this. And I think one of the biggest is that dominantly in our field, we use least squares methods where we're going to find the regression model that is sort of best fit to the uh, errors within our current sample. And in general, this is not a problem because we assume that these slopes come from a true population value. Um, but if we want to use those slopes in, for, that we got from one sample to then predict actual values in a new sample, we know we've sort of overfitted to the first sample. Um, another issue is, of course, this trade-off that's going to exist between 
prediction resolution, and unnecessary precision. So as always, the more variables that you tack on to your model, then you know, you're going to get greater variance in the unique values you're predicting for each uh, uh, participant, but you know some of those predictors you know might essentially be meaningless and don't really deserve to be in there. Um, so I evaluated six different methods of uh, you know doing this prediction. And I'll refer you to my talk appendix. And so what I mean by that is because I shared this talk um, on OSF's um, slide sharing service. Um, I realized that all my backup slides could actually be like supporting materials for the things that I was saying. So um, please check those out. I'm going to sort of um, gloss over and give you general recommendations in the next slide. Um, one other thing I want to say is that I also posted with my slides um, the R syntax that takes the public data and uh, reproduces every figure and number that you're going to see in this talk and in the talk appendix. So check that out if you either want to understand more about what I did or independently verify what I did. All right, so um, I think most of the time we're not going to have access to the original data. And in that case, we'll just go with the least squares estimates. I mean, that's essentially what we're doing anyway when we're doing direct replications. Um, so use the published values, and I actually think this is going to be the case most of the time. But if you do have access to the original data, then you can use it to build um, a better prediction model. So um, I found that the best method, or the best prediction model, was derived using Bayesian model averaging, which is very easy in R, but unfortunately you can't do it in SPSS. So another method that was, it was very good, it just wasn't as good, um, was using robust regression. And you actually can't do that in SPSS either. But luckily, um, Andy Hayes and Kai Lee uh, created a, a macro called HCREG that allows you to do that. So see the talk appendix because I have example syntax for how to do both of these things. Okay. So this is my prediction model for cross-ethnic friends. So you notice there's just an intercept uh, first and then some slopes in the predictors. I used the original covariates that I did in the original study because I just thought that was you know, the best way to do it. Um, and my main predictor is cross-ethnic closeness. Um, here's the model for cross-ethnic conflicts. Now I will say, uh, trying to measure or predict cross-ethnic conflicts uh, introduced a uh, clear boundary case of this approach. So if you notice the intercept there is about 0.2, meaning that I'm only expecting about, um, on average, one cross-ethnic conflict every five days. So this is a very rare event, and my prediction model predicted zero for everybody. And so what that means, of course, is that it's invariant, and thus I can't really evaluate the variance because, yeah. So I'm going to have to focus on cross-ethnic interactions, but mildly in defense of my uh, conflict model, um, at least in the first sample, which was uh, much smaller than the second, um, we didn't even observe any cross-ethnic conflicts, so you know, I predicted zero and there were zero. Okay, so the next steps are to collect your independent variables, do your predictions, collect your DVs. So um, we started with a sample of 82 people. This was longitudinal, we ended with 72. Um, you can get all the public data at those links. Um, so first, we at 8.45 p.m. Uh, one night, we posted um, a survey on Mechanical Turk that asked people about their demographic information and their social network information for their friends. Um, this survey was custom programmed um, in JavaScript using Google Script, uh, which isn't necessary, but you'll see why I did that once I get to study two. Um, and an important thing to mention now is that with every page that participants were completing in the survey, um, their values were being posted um, uh, to this publicly available spreadsheet, which since I pre-registered the study on OSF, if anyone had been paying attention, they could have followed that link when I pre-registered it and then watched my data come in. <laughs> um, so the next thing you do is you take the independent variables you got from that, plug them into your prediction model, make your predictions. An important part of this step is gonna be time stamping your predictions, improving you made them when you did, but I'll talk about that in the next slide. And then finally, I collected, or we collected all of the dependent variables, which is just asking people about every social interaction they had had consecutively, and information about you know, their partner. So, you gotta time stamp your um, predictions in a way that it couldn't be faked, right? Because it's all about establishing the temporal order of things. So how to do that? There's actually a number of ways. 
So one thing you can do would be to, you know, take a video of yourself and upload it to YouTube, um, and you know, describe your methods and uh, scroll through your final results. Um, another thing is doing it sort of like a poor man's copyright. So on the day after our first data collection, we just printed out um, a spreadsheet of all of our predictions, took advantage of registered mail system, uh, sent ourselves um, a, a letter with that uh, with those predictions. Notice we have a nice uh, date stamp over the seal here, and then you can wait until you're in front um, of skeptical colleagues, and then you open up your predictions. Well, you pull out your predictions, and that should be reasonably, um, you know, convincing. But really, this was all just for fun. Um, the most obvious thing is to post your predictions to a site like um, Open Science Framework or, say, GitHub, uh, where you'd have to do a pretty advanced hacking job in order to affect those timestamps. So what did we actually find? So what you see here are um, cross-ethnic interactions plotted on the x-axis, and it's just a histogram. So these are the predicted values in uh, turquoise. And then this navy blue line are the true values of cross-ethnic interactions observed for our sample on day two. Um, but we don't just want to eyeball it, right? We want a statistical approach to compare these uh, observed and actual values. So the first one is to focus on the values themselves. Um, and one thing you can do is simply correlate the two, and then you have a very sort of literal measure of R squared. Um, but I actually su uh, suggest that people regress their actual scores on their predicted scores, because you'll get the same R squared value when you do that model. It also gives you an intercept, which tells you whether or not you're over or underestimating um, value systematically, and I think that's a value. But really, a probably better um, way to evaluate this is to focus on you know, the prediction model itself. So you can run a path model where you fix every path to the slopes um, that, you, that were in your prediction model, and then evaluate model fit. So if we look at the first, um, at the first method, what you see here are predicted cross-ethnic interactions on the um, x-axis, observed cross-ethnic interactions on the y-axis, um, and so first I want to draw your attention to the intercept here. You see we're reliably under predicting um, people's uh, cross-ethnic interactions. So um, when we said they would have zero, you know, they had a high, reliably higher than zero value. Um, but uh, there's nonetheless a positive relationship between predicted and actual values. And in this case, although it's going to be lower in the next sample, but in this case, the R squared was 0.57. Um, in the next sample, it's 0.29, so still large. But it's kind of, I can't really fully verbalize to you how it's kind of thrilling and exciting to um, explain 57% of the variance with of future values with your predictions. Um, but as I said, probably the more true way to test this is by evaluating model fit. And indeed, we find that the prediction model that I developed ahead of time fit the new data quite well. So you might be thinking, you know, well, I don't do longitudinal work. How is this going to apply to me? Well, you can easily apply this approach in single session studies, too. So for the second study, um, we have 352 uh, adults from MTurk. Um, we did the survey all in one session. And now the key difference is that after participants finished the survey page that was the last independent variable, um, and this is why I use JavaScript, we just programmed um, you know, it so that it would stick those numbers into the prediction model come up with the actual predicted values, post that on the public spreadsheet with a timestamp, and then begin collecting all the deep variables. So again, we, these are the predicted and actual values overlaid on top of each other. Once again, because I didn't change it, the model is systematically um, under predicting the amount of cross-ethnic interactions people are having, um, but there's nonetheless a positive relationship between the predicted and actual values. Um, here, the R squared is 0.29, so explain 29% of variance. Um, and once again, with the path modeling approach, we saw excellent model fit with this new data set. So the conclusion I would draw on the substantive hypothesis is that indeed, if I know the diversity of your cross-ethnic friendships, then I can predict with a you know, relatively large uh, degree of accuracy how many cross-ethnic interactions you'll have today. Now, I think that this approach has a number of advantages, and one of the key is that um, it's robust against p-hacking, and thus it's robust against accusations of it. Um, it also provides a single test 
for direct replications. Um, they're really focused on criterion validity. And I also feel that this provides us with a framework to really build on and incorporate each other's work. Um, and I do want to take a quick moment to say that you might have already figured out it's not actually necessary to predict your values in between um, as long as you just uh, pre-register your prediction models and you can do all the analyses I've just said. So ultimately, the goal here is to move our field towards being a more cumulative and predictive science because we're only going to be able to say that we understand humans when we can predict them. But we're only going to be able to hone our predictions um, and make them accurate when, um, if we can trust the literature on which we're basing our prediction models. So I propose that we take advantage of the linear and forward um, uh, moving nature of time that exists in our little pocket of the universe um, to achieve both tasks. So thank you very much.